Hello. How awesome have these workshops been? My goodness. I know. I'm like, these women are so strong. It's such a blessing to serve with them, to learn from them, um, and just to see what God's doing here. And um, so for those of you who do not know who I am, my name is Gina, and I've been... <laughs> I've been attending church here like pretty much all my life um, since I was about 11. So um, I definitely have grown up with a lot of these women and women's names that you've heard today as that's such a strong person. That's my mentor. That's yeah, I agree. They're not wrong. Like these are the people you want to seek out and the people that you want to pray for you. And uh, it's just a real blessing. So uh, before we get started, I do just want to pray real quick. Um, Lord, I just thank you so much for just this retreat, the opportunity to gather here together, Lord, to learn about you, to understand you, to understand your ways, Lord. And I pray that you would speak through me now and that your message would be delivered, Lord, that um, you would speak to the hearts that need to hear it. And um, I just thank you, Lord. I thank you so much for the lessons that I've learned and the opportunity that I've had to um, just soak in your word. And I pray, Lord, that um, those lessons are, are evident and that they show, Lord, and that um, this message clearly is just from you. And I just thank you so much, Lord. Amen. All right. So I've had the honor of um, being a part of the name for this conference, which is Strong, which I love this because there's so many aspects to it. We can think about being strong women in the word. We can think about how strong our Lord is. There's a lot of different ways that we can interpret this, but it's just one strong word to convey so many feelings and so many things. Um, you know, the question that I have is, what do you think of when you hear the word strong? What happens in your mind when you think about strong in Christianity? Do you think about the Lord first? Do you think about yourself first? Do you think about other women first? Do you think about strong women being bodybuilders? Um, I know I won't name you out, but I have a friend that attends here, and she's tough, man. She's got the muscles. She's, she's a bodybuilder. I'm like, I'm impressed. And I think of her when I think of strong, right? Um, as you guys know, the title of my workshop today is Strong in Mind and Spirit, because this body ain't right? So when we were naming our workshops, I thought um, what I'm going to be talking on today really refers more to the mind and the spirit. And jokingly, I said, because this body ain't. And we all kind of said, yeah, let's keep that. Because I know I'm not the only person in this room that feels that way. So um, that's where that came about. But you know, we can think about weightlifting women. We can think about high self-esteem women, women who carry themselves in a manner that you go, how do they do that? How are they so strong-minded? How are they so nothing bothers them? Um, let me tell you the truth. Things bother them. They're just good at hiding it. Okay. So, um, you know, is it a woman of God? Wonder Woman? I don't know. I'd like to be Wonder Woman sometimes. A few superpowers wouldn't bother me, right? So, um, Zion, do we have a video available? Thumbs up. Okay. These are strong women. These are the women that we're surrounded with this weekend. These are real women. These are you. So when you doubt your strength and you know that the Lord is on your side, remember that you're strong. Don't let anybody tell you differently. I loved seeing this video. I'm super thankful. Thank you, CBI girls, for throwing this together last minute for me. Yes. There was no way I was going to gather pictures prior to my message, so um, they worked really quickly. <laughs> That's the next generation of strong. <laughs> you know, it's funny because um, I'll share a little bit about my daughter a little later, but I'm looking around and I'm watching my daughter and her interaction with other girls here. She attends JS and um, her demeanor, the conversations that we have, they're the next generation of strong women. And uh, I saw David and Blaine, both baby wearing their little boys. And I was like, and that's the next generation of iron sharpens iron, right? So, you know, I understand that whole raising the next generation. It's really um, just, it's a beautiful thing to be a part of. So 
Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about strong. The definition, and you know, I, I have to say, Brenda brought definition, which I was super excited about. I have information about Deborah that I wanted to talk about that I didn't have room in my notes for, that Jean covered the whole thing on. So I know that God has orchestrated these workshops to come together to speak to us today, and I am so blessed by that. So the definition of strong is having the power um, to move heavy weights or perform other physically demanding tasks. So that's the first definition. The next definition is able to withstand great force or pressure. <laughs> yeah, not this girl. I have bad balance. I don't have great eyesight anymore. Don't turn 40 or even older, it goes. Um, so, you know, there's one thing that um, martial arts will tell you, and I've never done martial arts in my life, but I've sat through enough conferences to know that it's not about how strong you are, it's about the leverage. Okay, so it's about how you hold your body and lean into things versus how strong you actually are. So that gives me a little bit of comfort to think, okay, I could withstand some great force. So it's about leverage. It's about pressing into Jesus when those forces come against you, okay? So the next thing here, it says not easily disturbed, upset, or affected. We're gonna talk about that. Showing determination, self-control, and good judgment firmly held or established, and very intense, as in maybe like a smell could be very intense. I know some very intense people, and I'm not talking about smells, I'm just talking about in general. <laughs> um, you know, kind of like Jean's story about losing your smell. For any of us who've had COVID, I'm pretty sure that you can say your smell is just not what it used to be, so intense has a different meaning now. But um, that's not where we're going. So in Acts 20, 24, it says, but none of these things move me. So Paul knew that no matter what life threw at him, that he was going to get through it by God, right? So when it says here, not easily disturbed, upset, or affected, I don't know anybody. That's not true. I do. I do know Femme. Femme is one of the most even kill people you will ever meet. He seems un, like unshaken, unmoved. I am not that same way. I am shaken easily. Things get under my skin. It's hard to keep moving forward. But Paul knew none of these things move me. So things are going to happen in our lives, and yes, they may affect us, but the strength that we draw from the Lord will help us not be moved by that. So how many of us can actually say, I will not be moved? I would be willing to bet that at least half of the people in this room questioned whether they were going to get here at all this weekend because something came up that moved them, some sort of con conflict arose. I would be willing to bet that half of those people had something happen just today that made them not want to return just from last night. Okay, these are things that happen all the time because we're moved and we allow arguments with our spouses on the way to church to change our whole mood. How come I never argue with him on the way to the movies? <laughs> Why? Why are we only, and, and my husband and I really don't argue much, but why do those things happen when we're on our way to serve the Lord? On Thursday night, we were here getting things prepared and he wasn't feeling 100%. And he's asking me questions and he wants to know this and he wants to know that. And I finally stopped him and I looked at him and I said, I need you to Google that because I can't brain it right now. So don't move me. <laughs> and he's like, got it. Get the kid, get in the car, we're bye. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, sometimes we have to draw those boundaries for ourselves and say, I can't put one more thing on my plate. I can't answer one more question. I can't mom that hard today, right? So um, we sometimes have to have those moments. I think of my mom when uh, things that would move us, we would be a family of seven in the car on our way to somewhere nice that mom had planned some sort of adventure for us. Uh, mom's great about like surprises. So we never necessarily knew where we were going, but it was going to be a fun day and we'd be like out of control in the back. Maybe that was my anxiety of like, I don't know what we're doing and I need to know the plan that like maybe created a little bit of extra trouble, but it was always every time I plan something nice, you kids fill in the blank. Y'all are moms, you know, right? 
So, and now that I'm a mom, I totally get it. I'm like, I asked you to put your shoes on so we can go do something fun. You know, so I always think about those are the little things that move us. Those are the daily things that move us. It's like just get in the car so we can be to school on time. Like, let's do this. For those of you who know me, you know that that struggle is very real. Um, <laughs> so we're all guilty of letting these things move us even to the point of anxiety. So I wanna talk a little bit about anxiety. I first want you to know I'm, that I recently received my degree in behavioral science and I'm in my master's plan at GCU and I'm continuing that, thank you. Um, but I'm continuing that career path because of the anxiety that I experienced as I've gotten older. And you know, they say that like midlife crisis happens um, it definitely happens. I'm trying to determine what midlife actually is, but according to the textbooks, it's between 35 and 60. So <laughs> you decide if you're in midlife or not, uh, but <clears throat> that's, it's a very big, yeah, so apparently you go from young adult to senior citizen with one large gap, I don't know. Um, but nonetheless, I made this decision to um, switch gears later in life than I had wanted to, but I'll tell you right now, I'm so glad that I did because number one, I've learned so much more about myself, and number two, if I had gone into this field at 22, I would not have been ready to do that. So um, I'm grateful to be where I am, but that's where some of this information is coming from today that I'm bringing is a little bit of that education in addition to just being a Christian woman, and how do we mix those two together? So the definition of anxiety is that it's characterized by feelings of worry or fear um, that are strong enough to interfere with one's daily activities, okay? For some people, that is worse than others. There can be healthy anxiety or stress, and there can be unhealthy or negative anxiety and stress. The healthy one is the one that keeps us going. It keeps us motivated. It helps us get through things. Um, if you're a procrastinator like me, it helps you work under pressure. Um, so those can be good anxieties or good stress, if you will. The negative stress, that's gonna be where you have panic attacks, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, PTSD, stress that is out of proportion in comparison to the situation, restlessness, phobias, elevated heart rates, fatigue, increased breathing or upset stomach. Those are all some of the things that anxiety can do to us. Now we know that the Bible tells us in Philippians 4, 6 to be anxious for nothing. It says in Luke 12, 29, don't have an anxious mind. It says in, um, I did not write down, it's Luke somewhere. Do not fear, therefore you are of more value than sparrows. And my personal favorite, do not worry about tomorrow. And that is Matthew 6, 34. And that's my life verse, actually. Um, but, you know, we know these verses. We've heard these verses. Cast your fears upon me. Cast your anxieties upon me. You know, casting is not like, um, like, here you go, Lord. Like, that word is like when you think about fishing, right? I think like, okay, so you take the cast and, and you fling it out there, and then you reel it back in. That's how I always thought of casting, but casting actually means to, like, fling it out there. Like, get rid of it. So, um, you know, we know that the Lord is there for us, and we know that he covers that for us and that we need to press into that. Um, we have these messages on mugs. We have them on our Bible covers. We wear them on our shirts. We put them on our cute little letter boards. We hang them in our hallways and in our bathrooms. And then we walk by them and we drink out of the mugs. And we don't for a minute go, oh yeah, that, right? There's a reason why I bought that because it was reminding me of something at some point in time. And then we stand there with our coffee mugs. We're like, be still and know that I'm gone. Get this coffee in, right? Okay, yeah, so um, it's easy for those thoughts to overwhelm our minds, the negative thoughts to overrun the thoughts that the Lord has for us and the direction that he's given to us. So when we allow that anxiety to creep in, it becomes consuming. So in transparency, I will show, share with you that I struggled with anxiety. I still struggle with anxiety. Um, my life verse is Matthew 6, 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day is sufficient in its own. Meaning, why am I investing all of this angst into a day that I am not guaranteed? Okay. So having said that, when I was younger, the anxiety would be to the place where I didn't want to, I wasn't like 
can't leave home agoraphobic, um, but I didn't want to leave home um, if I didn't know where we were going, who we were going to be with, why we were going, when we were going to be there. I needed to know anywhere that we were going to go where the public restroom was going to be because I needed to be prepared in case my anxiety decided it didn't want to play games. Um, so I have always just struggled with that and I've always had to remind myself the Lord has us in control. Even today, I know I've shared with some of you before, my phone will ring and I, you know, mom's phone number comes up and I'm like, okay, what happened? And she's just like, hey, wanna come over for lunch? Okay, but in my mind, I've already planned out that there's bad news on the other side. Why do I do that? I don't know. I cannot, cannot be alone in this. I know this. Um, but, you know, I have to remind myself that not everything is a negative thing. And I'm not a negative person. I just have negative thoughts that I have to battle. And I have to press into the Lord to remember that. Giving in to the anxiety does not make us strong. It makes us worry warts. It makes us crazy. It makes us do things that are not normal. So pressing into the Lord is where my strength is. I was talking with a good friend of mine about the things that bring us anxiety, um, things that we have difficulty getting through with joy or doing in a serving manner um, because we're hung up on those anxieties that go along with it. Um, but we know that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Yes, Nehemiah 8 says that. So there are things like uh, public speaking, test taking, spiders. I don't know. What's, what's your vice, right? Um, but the Lord gives us strength to power through that. Okay? He also gives us fly swatters and other tools to equip us. Um, Flip-flops and husbands. So... <laughs> Of all of the things I have anxiety over, spiders are actually not one of them. So my friends call with spider issues. I'm like, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyways, so we talked about the compound anxiety that happens when, um, when we know what the Lord is calling us to do. And we know that it creates an anxiety in us. And then we have that compound anxiety of going, I'm doing this for the Lord. I know this is what the Lord wants me to do, and now I have anxiety over it, and that gives me anxiety for having anxiety because I know that that is not what the Lord wants for me. He does not want me to be anxious, and that creates more anxiety. Can you see the compound anxiety that happens here? Okay. So when the Lord asks you to do something and you're like, no, I don't want to, and then you have anxiety over that, so you just say, yes, Lord, and then you have anxiety over that? Yeah. See? Here we go around the mulberry bush. Uh, so for those of us that have that negative anxiety, let me ask you this. Would you press into the Lord as strongly as you do if he had not allowed anxiety in your life? Not everybody deals with anxiety, and I understand that. But I know that for some of us, I believe that it's almost a gift because it's the Lord's way of calling me back to him. It's the Lord's way of saying, hey, hey, me over here, so that I don't forget that. I know the goodness that he's doing, and I know that he's asking me to keep talking to him, and that he's asking me to keep crying out to him. You know, they say, seven days without prayer makes one week, W-E-A-K. And that is the truth, right? So, however, when we let anxiety drive us, we see those side effects that take place. Overwhelming feelings can send you over the edge. Once an episodic panic attack comes on, it's very hard to regain that control. Most people who have had a panic attack say they feel that like they are out of control. And when that happens, they feel like they can't bring themselves to a place to pray because it's almost like they're out of control. And that's when we are able to step in and pray over them and help them um, come back down, if you will. Okay, so um, 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, take every thought captive. So it actually starts from 10, 3 through 6, and it says, for though we walk in the flesh, meaning we're human, that we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So those strongholds in this case are wrong thoughts, misperceptions, or contrary to God's word. So we probably deal with those things all day long. Those are the things that create us work anxiety like Anita was talking about in the workplace. And how do you combat that? You come back to the Lord and you start working through it with him. When we begin to let self-efficacy 
uh, keep us from seeking God, we begin to think that we can handle things on our own rather than with the help of God. What happens when that happens is we start to withdraw. We withdraw from fellowship. We withdraw from things that bring us joy. And we start viewing things that used to bring us joy as not fun. And we start allowing the world or the carnal aspect of things to creep in. We start saying, well, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And we've all heard this, right? Well, let me tell you. I was in an auto accident seven years. It did not kill me, and it 100% did not make me stronger. Okay? I struggle with these things every day. It makes me nervous to drive when it's windy. It makes me, um, it makes me unable to lift heavy things. I have a blind spot in my eye. This is not about me, I'm just saying. Sometimes the last song that was playing before I blacked out, when it comes on the radio, if I'm driving, my stomach goes bloop, okay? It's just that little flip-flop. That didn't make me stronger, but pressing into Jesus did, okay? And that is how I got through it. So when you think about those things that happen in our lives and how they make us stronger, yeah, it didn't kill you, but it didn't make me physically stronger. So now we're talking about the body at week, right? Um, my insurance agent, I told him, Getting in a car accident was one of my worst fears. I'm sure it's probably everybody's worst fear. And he says, well, worst fears usually don't happen twice. Congratulations, you got yours out of the way. You should be fine. <laughs> I can't thank him enough for those words. It was actually very comforting at that moment. Now I just pray that my house doesn't burn down and we'll be good. So, <laughs> uh, so for some of you, those things that didn't kill you but make you stronger, maybe they're smells that trigger you, that take you back to a place that was uncomfortable. Maybe it's a song on the radio. Maybe it's a place that you go. Maybe it's a sound that you hear. I hear the rumbling of anything, and I'm like, earthquake. Hold the fort down, right? I mean, I, I just like can't handle it. Those were some of the things that started the anxiety early in my life. Um, so when we trust God and we surrender these burdens to him, we're allowing his strength to fill us. And that's what's going to make us stronger. So it's not about if you have enough trust in the Lord. It's not about you just need stronger faith. It's about believing that he can and he will get you through those times when you do not feel strong. And he will strengthen you. And it is remembering that. It is also not forsaking the fellowship. Because if you remember the account of Joshua and the war that he was fighting with the Amalekites, we read about it in Exodus 17, 8 through 13. And paraphrase, it says that Joshua was fighting against Amalek and Moses was holding up his arms. And every time that Moses put his arms down, the Amalekites started to win and Joshua began to be defeated. And Aaron and her noticed what was happening, and they grabbed a stone, and they brought it behind Moses for him to sit on, and then they held his arms up, because Moses' arms became heavy. Have you been in that place where your arms become heavy? My arms feel a little heavy right now. Um, and so they were holding his arms up. That is the fellowship of Christ. That is the body. That is the strong women that are here right now that come along your side, and they say, I can tell that you are weary. I can see that you need to sit. I can see that you are doing great things for the Lord, but you just need a little assistance. Let me hold your arms up because we can see the goodness that is happening. So I encourage you, ladies, look for those women that need their arms held up or be okay with admitting you are a woman that just needs someone to come alongside them and hold your arms up. So we know that once that went through, um, Joshua was able to defeat um, Amalek because of this. So we aren't meant to carry these burdens on our own. That doesn't make us weak to admit that we need help. Um, and this is why it's important that we stay in fellowship and that we don't allow that isolation to take place because anxiety and depression will come in. And what does the enemy seek to do? Divide us. And one of the best ways that he's going to do that is use isolation. And that's going to be self-isolation most often because we find ourselves going, I'm not like that person. I don't fit in here. And we withdraw. It's not what God wants. 
He wants us to be iron sharpening iron. I know Anita talked about that a um, couple of times as well. He wants us to spend that time together, working together to combat that weakness. Because when we come together as the body of Christ, we are whole. Someone else is my better left eye, okay? So what happens is when we come together, we have strength. There's strength in numbers. The dictionary also said 50 strong. Like that's how you might see that word is we're 50 strong. Well, we're like 400, almost 500 women strong this weekend. There is strength in numbers. Yeah, right? So when we come together for that and rely on God, we see big things happen in the kingdom. I recently heard a great saying um, that was talking about, I don't know everything. I know a lot, but I don't know everything. And you don't know everything, and you don't know everything, and you don't know everything. But you know a lot, and you know a lot. And when we come together, we know a really lot. We know a really lot. Yes, I always like how Marilee talks about how uh, her first marriage and her second marriage, how much time together she's been a married woman and has the experience of that. So, you know, when you think about the experience that we have when we come together, that's 500 strong, okay? So the body of Christ will also come together in strength, but society tells us you're only as strong as your weakest link. I'm not sure that that's true because in my weakness, who's made strong? He's made strong. In your weakness, who's made strong? He's made strong, that's right. So his power is made perfect in my weakness. And I never think about that because we think about weaknesses now we negative self-talk and we think about that is our, our, my weakness is my weakness and then it's about me instead of about him and his strength. Instead of saying, this is an area that I struggle, we can look at it and say, this is an area that the Lord has given me to grow, to exemplify his strength and to um, witness to other people even about his strength and how he's gotten me through some of those times. Uh, so in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 11 is where we see that um, it says that his power is made perfect in my weakness and I can delight in my weakness because he, uh, they glorify, excuse me, I can delight in my weaknesses because they glorify God. So, you know, when we say, I want to be a vessel for you, I'm sure that many of you have said, here I am, Lord, send me. But... Some of us are like, um, but I need you to provide the transportation or actually, and we have all these excuses and things, right? But a lot of us have said, I want to be a vessel for you. But not many of us had said, I want to be a broken vessel for you. We want to be the most pristine vase. We want to be beautiful. We want to be used for his glory. Okay, let me tell you, ladies, we live in a world of everything is repurposed, and I am perfectly happy to be a broken vessel and repurposed for his purpose. Okay, so... What I want you to know is that if you feel like that broken vessel, it's okay, okay? Because if you're struggling with anxiety or depression or other mental health concerns, you are not broken. It is okay. And that is a word for somebody here. You are not broken. And God is going to fill you, and he is going to use you. So when we talk a lot about normalizing, you guys heard that word normalizing? Right now we're talking a lot about normalizing pronouns. I, I don't care what you call me, just treat me with respect. Like, it doesn't matter to me. But we talk a lot about acceptance. We talk a lot about normalizing things. And normalizing, talking about mental health, is something that we hear in our industry quite a lot. Um, with GCU students on our discussion forums, we've had some really amazing conversations with how there's such a stigma with mental health, especially amongst us Christians, because we want to press into God. We want to spend that time with him. We want him to heal us, and we know that he can but we also know that there are other options available. There's Christian counseling available. If you have healthy med management, those are things that don't make you weak if that is what you need to survive. And it's not always going to be forever. It could be a season. But if that's not what God has for you and you don't have a peace about it, that's okay too. So the other thing that they talk a lot about normalizing is self-care, right? You guys have all heard the term self-care? Okay. I vacillate between two of them because sometimes I think self-care is really important because taking a bath is important. 
right? That's self-care. Getting a good cup of coffee, that's self-care. Spending six bucks on it, maybe not. But, you know, when we do the things that we take care of ourselves, there are basic needs that fall into self-care that are important. But then we have other things like, um, you know, what do you do for self-care? What's your favorite activity? Well, I don't set up candles in my bathroom and take a bath and read the best self-help book that just came out. Um, that's not for me. You know, we talk about having a self-care kit, which is like, what's in your emergency kit? Which I kind of like this idea because it's a little bit of like, what do you do when you just need to refresh? What do you have? Maybe for some people it's a crossword puzzle. For other people it's like Play-Doh or, you know, sitting down and writing or their favorite iPad, uh, excuse me, their favorite iPod music or, you know, whatever. But do you have a Bible in your self-care kit? Okay. That's something that is number one self-care. Um, the more that we look at self-care, the more we look at me, 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 and the less we look at the Lord, who ultimately is going to fix the problems that we are trying to heal ourselves with self-care. So we need to read the word, we need a fellowship, we need a worship. That's all self-care. I heard it said just this weekend that it's soul care versus self-care, and I love that term. Um, I thought that was amazing. Exercise, that's another self-care. We we'll hear a lot about that. We know it's good for us. We know we should go out and do it. I know that there are exercise enthusiasts and I love you guys. I appreciate what you can do. I cannot, uh, or I will not, I don't know, one of the two. So how do you get stronger? When you think about exercise, you get stronger, you lift weights. You build your muscles by lifting weights, doing reps, you increase the weight, you increase the reps, and you build those muscles eventually as that goes. Our spiritual muscle has to be worked out in order to increase our spiritual strength. So they say that pain is weakness leaving the body. Any of you who work out probably know that. I say, yeah, I'm gonna die, okay? Usually comes a little bit with like I can't breathe. Um, and then they say, but did you die? Right, have you guys seen the shirts that say that? Did you die though? And I'm like, to myself, yeah. Um, and so, you know, sometimes it hurts to work our spiritual muscle. God has to get in there and do that pruning. We have to allow him that space and that time to get in there. We have to do the reps. For me, the reps, memorizing, do not worry about tomorrow. Do not worry about tomorrow. Gerald makes us do reps every Sunday. Right? And again, say it again, right? And we repeat the verses that he's pulled out for us. And that's how we become stronger in the Lord, by doing the reps. Um, being strong requires discipline, practice, and endurance. Hebrews 12.1 says, run with perseverance the race that's marked out for us. Well, I'll just tell you, when it comes to running, I run late, I run my mouth, not that I'm happy about that, and I run with endurance the best that I can and perseverance the best that I can. And I really think that's all that God is asking of us is to give him our all and do it the best that we can. Not comparing ourselves to the best that someone else can because we don't know their struggles. We don't know what Wonder Woman is hiding when her superpowers are gone, right? So I had an opportunity to visit with the, um, the recovery group here. My class had an assignment to observe a drug recovery group and these gals were fantastic. I really enjoyed my time sitting with them and just having conversation and their topic for the evening was talking about meekness. So when you hear meekness, I think a lot of people have a misperception of what it is and tend to compare it to weakness. But meekness is actually strong. It's talking about being gentle, being in self-control. I don't know about you guys, but it can be hard to have some self-control sometimes, you know, to not run my mouth, to not say things that I'm going to regret later, to be gentle in my delivery with things. I know that I am not the most gentle person out here. I know that that is something I have to work on with myself to keep my sarcasm under control, to, you know, just keep keep that under control and that meekness is really a form of strength and so it was really neat to um to listen to that and understand that you know sometimes we snap 
It happens. Um, sometimes, especially if somebody's being snappy with us. But each time that we resist that feeling, we grow in strength. So, um, a shameless plug for Christmas, now that, you know, this evening's almost over, ready to start party planning again. <laughs> um, so our guest speaker, as of right now, is Ruth Beeler, and she said um, that we can't teach others self-care and self-love and build their self-esteem because they will feel worse when they fail. So think about that for a moment. When I think about how I'm raising my daughter, I want her to be a strong woman. I want her to be a strong individual. I want her to be an advocate. I want her to love her friends and speak with kindness. I want her to be a leader. We all want these things for our children, but we have to set the example for her. And when I tell her, you're the best little speller in the world, but she misses 10 consecutively on like every test, she thinks she's devastated. She thinks I'm devastated. She thinks that her whole world is gonna come undone, that she's gonna fail the fifth grade. And I'm like, it's just a test. It's a bad grade, we're gonna get through it, right? When we build ourselves up and we build others up by encouraging them to do that, are we setting them up for failure because we're encouraging them to put their faith in themselves? So that loyalty is redirected from God to self. And we have to look at what are we basing our worth on? Because if our loyalty is to me, and I start putting my worth in myself, I'm worthless. My body doesn't do the strength things that normal bodies might do. So these are the areas where depression and anxiety can grow in a person because we've set them up to to fail, and it's like planting those seeds, right? Um, I had said a couple of months ago that there was a time in my life where I allowed people to place and plant seeds of doubt within me, and then I watered them, okay? Because I allowed myself to feel that and to, to doubt myself as well. But with the Lord, I am in a place of weed plucking now. Nope, we do not need those thoughts. And that's what we're working through, me and the Lord, together. Um, because that's where that strength is going to come from. Um, do you know what the most accessible drug is right now? Sugar. Somebody said sugar. But that's not the answer. Negative self-talk. Right? I heard that at a seminar the other day, and I was all, like, mind blown. Because when we... When we water those seeds that others have, have done, or have planted, <laughs> we're killing ourselves. We're hurting our creator. Our creator who has planned the time that he has to make us who we are, and then we stand there and we criticize him because we're talking negative to ourselves. The one who loves us with all of his heart, and we are criticizing ourselves. I like this little phrase. I picked this up a couple of years ago when I hear my friends self like bad talking themselves or my daughter. She'd be like, oh, I'm so stupid. And I look at her and I go, do not talk about my daughter like that. Right? Do not talk about my friend like that. And sometimes we need that little reminder to not talk about ourselves like that. Number one, it's not our place to judge ourselves. And number two, we're just putting that loyalty back into ourselves as well. So, making sure that we are acknowledging our need for Christ, that's the most important. That's what's going to bring us joy, letting ourselves go and coming back to the Lord. So, when you think about, I want to go back to self-care for a minute, what did women like Ruth do for self-care? Or Jael? Jael put a stake through a man's head. Uh, I'm sorry, in this life, we need therapy after that. <laughs> You know, how did she get through that? How did she know? What about Esther? When we were, um, as I was studying and planning my lecture, I was just talking with my daughter. I like to fill space with my daughter when we're driving. And I asked her, I said, who do you think is a strong woman in the Bible? She says, well, I haven't learned about all of them yet, Mom. And I'm like, that's okay, you're going to get there. And she just blows my mind sometimes. And she goes, well, I think Esther. So I said, okay, tell me why. She goes, Okay, and she, like, she gets all excited and she starts telling me and she says, because Esther went before her king and she saved her people and she was brave. 
and she wasn't supposed to go before the king because she could have died. And I'm like, she's telling it with this, all this excitement. And I was like, I'm so proud of her right now. But having that moment of talking about, you know, like how strong she is and naming strong women. The truth is she could name more strong men in the Bible than she could women, but that's okay because it gave us this great opportunity to talk about that and what makes them strong. Right? Was Delilah strong in personality when she talked Samson into giving up his secret of strength? Yeah. Was that strength for the Lord? No. You know, so when we started talking about some of these people, it was really fun to hear like where where her thought process went on that. And I think that is a reflection of the work that people are doing here. Sunday school teachers, regular school teachers, building these these children and molding them. Gwen can tell me Bible stories I didn't even think that she knew or could comprehend. And that blows my mind and it makes me feel bad for not having enough conversation with her, but it always opens up a great, great story. And I can see her little strong personality growing as she's growing. So going back to the self-care that these women of the Bible may have um, used, you know, the Holy Spirit is the comforter. And It says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And that's in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. He is the self-care that we need. He is the soul care that we need. And then it goes on to say that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So you don't have to be strong as an ox to carry it. Right? So let's talk a little bit about the yoke. The yoke was the piece that went over... um, the oxen's head and basically it was used for guidance so when we look at this verse and we break it down um he's saying that that yoke isn't heavy it's not burdensome it's light and his guidance is gentle he's not putting a bridle or a bit in our mouth and yanking our heads where he wants us to go he's just putting the yoke on us as not even a burden, but as a light guidance and a gentle guidance. And I'm sure that many of you have felt that guidance this weekend as you've been here through the messages, maybe prayer time with the prayer team or with individuals and your peers through the messages that have been given. Um, I know I felt that gentle guidance and um, don't ignore it. Some of the strongest women in the Bible heeded that gentle guidance. We've talked about them, Ruth and Mary and Esther and Deborah. And, you know, Deborah is one of the gals that we've had a lot of conversation on recently, and I'm so glad that Jean refreshed our memory about her story. But, you know, when we studied her in our women's fellowship, there was a great discussion that took place at our table. And one of the things that I know women struggle a lot with is, my husband's not the spiritual leader of our household or I'm not married, I don't have a spiritual leader in my household. Yes, you do, it's you. And it's okay to be in that space. It's okay to fill that hole and be that spiritual leader until your husband steps up to that plate. We talked, Brenda talked about praying for your husband and not nagging him. I used to tell my husband all the time, I just need you to be a spiritual leader. Well, what does that mean? I don't know, just do it. Okay, I couldn't identify it. I couldn't say, well, this will make you a better spiritual leader. I just knew that I wanted him to be one. And then one day he just was. And he still is. And now we have a very different level because I don't have that, like, I just need you to be anymore. But in the meantime, it was okay for me to be the spiritual leader in the household and give him that encouragement. It is okay for you to teach your children about God and about the love of God and help them to be strong individuals if your husband isn't filling that role or if you're a single parent or you're raising other people's children. We talked earlier today, it takes a village. Now it takes neighboring cities, okay? So... There's nothing wrong with being the spiritual leader of your household when you need to fill that gap. But I will say, when someone comes in to fill that gap, whether that's your husband, whether you get married, let them be that spiritual leader. Because if you don't, it's going to wedge and make things uncomfortable in your marriage. Uh, I think Brenda said, we can't all be in charge either, right? So um, looking at at the story of... um, of Deborah and just how she was a judge and a leader and that um, she, she showed us that we're strong enough. As women, we're strong enough to be leaders. Um, Ephesians 6, 
talks about the armor of God and just putting it on doesn't make us strong. It makes us prepared, but it doesn't make us strong in and of itself. You can put armor on all day long. My nephew, he's so cute. He went into the, he's like almost 23. He went into the military and I saw a picture of him in his uniform and I was a little bit like Halloween's not here yet. So you can take your costume off, but he's a military man. Like he, this is real, this is his job. This is what he's doing. But unless he trains, he's not ready for battle. You can wear the uniform, but it doesn't make you strong and ready for battle. We need to equip ourselves and equip ourselves in our mind, talking about the helmet of salvation and knowing where that salvation comes from. You guys all know the, um, the, the armor of God, um, but talking about the girding our, our waist with truth and the breastplate of righteousness, shodding your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, taking the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And you know, the sword of the spirit is not a sword. It is not your Bible. It is your tongue. We have to use the spirit. We have to use the word of God. We have to speak it for that weapon to be effective. So we know that the thief comes to rob our joy and that we find, he finds our weaknesses and he uses them against us. The mind is a powerful thing, and I often joke that I can't be left alone with my own thoughts, because that rabbit hole is deep, <laughs> and it can go. And anxiety, um, just to talk about a few things here, anxiety can affect roughly 6.8 million adults, and only 43 of them are getting some sort of help. 43%, excuse me. Women are twice as likely as men to experience anxiety, and it's often accompanied by depression. Children are affected at about 31 out of 100. Those are old stats. You've heard what's happening to our children. We know that depression level is a lot higher because now they're confused too. So we have read that um, between the ages of 13 and 18 is where that number comes from. And that can lead to risky behavior, poor social um, skills, skipping school and other things. We have to be those women that fill the gap. We have to be those women that come alongside these children and help to raise them up and mentor them. Depression affects approximately 14.8 14 million adults in the U.S. Um, for 18 and over. The prevalence is much higher among women and children than it is among men. Did you know that there is seasonal depression? It's called SAD. S-A-D. It is real. And it's seasonal affective disorder. And basically what that means, and people up um, in like Washington and Oregon suffer from this a lot, it's a lack of vitamin D. So when the time changes, it's a lack of sunlight. I think it's a lack of sun, S-O-N, sunlight, right? So we have to remember to press into the Lord when we're feeling that. Depression is uh, persistent feelings of sadness or loss of interest in things that affect our daily functioning, oftentimes associated with not a sad day, but maybe extreme sadness over a period of time. And that can be caused by life issues, anger, failure, rejection, family divides, maybe divorces or um, trouble within the family, abuse, neglect, sexual assault, loss, grief, shame, loss of control or autonomy, loneliness, hormones, okay? These are all things that can cause the depression. There aren't things that, uh, these aren't things that a person just snaps out of um, without intention to get better. So we have to cry out to the Lord. Psalm 130 uh, verses 1 through 2 and 5 says, Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I do hope. Hope is lost when we rely upon ourselves or the world to help us through the anxiety and the depression and other mental health conditions. It's hard to find joy in that suffering. But that's not to say you can't feel happy in a bout of depression or you can't experience happiness amongst grief. It's okay to laugh when you're in a time of mourning. The joy of the Lord is my strength. So that comes from him. Um, Proverbs 17:22 says, a cheerful, cheerful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. Ladies, there is hope 
for a strong mind and a strong spirit. It begins in the heart. The desire for change to affect, uh, the desire for change, the effort to seek the help and pressing into Jesus so that we can be clothed in strength and dignity, so that we can laugh at the future. I think of two things when I think of this first. I think of Kim Walker, first of all, who does a lot of our music, and in the middle of her song, she'd be like, ha ha! I know you all have heard it, right? And I think about that laugh that is just, it's joy, you know, and she's got that in the future. And the other thing I think about is when you get hit with trial after trial after trial, by about like the fourth trial, something happens, all you can do is laugh, because you're like, of course it is, yeah, right? right? And we hit that space where we just laugh at it. We have an opportunity to freak out, stress out, have an anxiety attack over it, or we can just laugh at it and go, the Lord's got this, it's, go, it's gonna be okay. And when I read this verse, I think about that strength that the Lord has given to me to just be like, I'm just gonna laugh at it, it's okay. I'm not afraid of it. It's not gonna take me down. The human side of me goes, whoa, this is bad. This is destruction. But the spirit within inside me says, it's going to be okay. In John 7, 38, it says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So in the Hebrews, the belly was the seat of emotions. So some of us might call it in intuition. Some of us might call it instinct. Some of us call it a gut feeling, right? That gut feeling can be the prompting of the Holy Spirit. That can be when your emotions are upside down and you're not tuned into the Lord, why you have that feeling here. And it's not here, it's not here, it's here. And that's, that's where the Lord is speaking to us. And some of you might have that gut feeling right now. And I would just encourage you that if you have that stirring in your gut and you have that feeling in your gut, I would like you to pray with me um, if you're ready to seek freedom from anxiety or depression and that's something that, that you're um, just struggling with because we want to have strong minds and strong spirits. Those come first place to my body. I, do I want to be strong? Yeah, I would love to. Would I love to run a 10K someday? <clears throat> Absolutely. <clears throat> but that's not in my future, I'm pretty sure. But, you know, if, if you want to receive freedom from that, I have a short prayer that I would like to pray with you. And um, if you would like further prayer afterwards, I will meet with two other um, women of our fellowship over at the Welcome Center, which is in the uh, sanctuary. I will meet over there in the fireside room if you would like to have further prayer, if this is something that you struggle with. But in the meantime, I would like to go ahead and close with this prayer. So if everybody would just bow your heads. I'm not gonna make you stand. I'm not gonna make you um, raise your hand or anything, but I just want you to um, pray this with me and I'll say it slow enough. And we're gonna cry out to the Lord. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. I will wait for you, Lord. My soul waits for you. And in your word, I place my hope. And we thank you so much, Lord, for this afternoon. We thank you so much for the joys that you've brought to us, the messages that you've brought to us. We pray that you'll bless the rest of our evening. And uh, we just thank you for the things that you're doing, Lord. Amen.